Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Hey, listen, are you guys ready to get into the word of the Lord this morning? Well, I sure am. You know, I pray that you don't come into this place to hear from a man. I pray you don't come to hear from a woman, a tall man, a short man, a white man, a, a dark man, whatever it might be. We don't come here to do that. That's not why we're here. We're not here for ceremonial or traditional uh, traditional ritual, rit- rituals, but rather we're here to hear from God. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. If you're able to stand, would you join me in standing as we go before the Lord in prayer in reverence and in honor? Father, we come before you in this place and we're just grateful, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to be here in the house. fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. So Lord, it's in the name of Jesus that we ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us, to minister to us, to show us things in our heart and our lives to come. Lord, I pray that the word today would be a seed planted into good ground in our hearts, that we could go and leave this place in water and cultivate that word, that it would bear much fruit in our lives. And Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that, that you've bestowed upon us, your people. Lord, we don't ask these blessings just upon ourselves, but rather on all the churches across the world and around the Inland Empire that are preaching and teaching the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. At no time do we see ourselves as better than anybody, but as co-laborers in the kingdom of God. So, Father, we ask that you would bless our Catholic brothers and sisters and our Baptist brothers and sisters and our Episcopalian and Methodist and Lutheran and Presbyterian brothers and sisters. Lord, I ask that you set your hand upon Harvest and the Grove and Sandals. God, I thank you for Ecclesia and Emmanuel Baptist and Trinity. Lord, for Abundant Living and Oak Valley and Crossroads and all the churches all across the Inland Empire and around the world that are teaching and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we lift up our brothers and sisters in Coachella Valley, Lord, our brothers and sisters in South Riverside and in Temecula and in, and in North San Diego, Lord, we thank you for our, our fellow rock churches all across the Inland Empire and around Southern California, Lord, we thank you for the ability that you've given us to go and spread the word of God and teach the gospel to all generations, Lord, and we thank you for them, Lord, we ask that they be blessed today as well, be filled, be fulfilled in what they do, in Jesus' mighty name, Lord, we give you the glory, we give you the honor, we give you the praise, and we thank you for it, in Jesus' name, Amen. Well, as you're being seated, if you've got your Bibles with you, go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Luke, to the book of Luke in the ninth chapter. I'm excited for the word this morning. I know that you're going to get something out of it. Luke in the ninth chapter. Now, normally what I try to do when, when preparing something, when preparing something to say, oftentimes I find in my own life the most difficult part is not preaching or teaching. It's not creating notes. The most difficult part for me is the title. I don't know. It's just something about trying to what to call it. You know, it's like you finish it all up and now title's like the icing on the cake. And I always try to come up with a, a witty title or something that's fun or, you know, something that you can remember throughout the week. And, you know, this week I, I, I was spent more time probably trying to figure out the title than anything. And so I just said, you know, what, let's just call it for what it is this week, forget the witty and the, the inventive and the creative titles. Let's just call this message what it is this week. So the title of this morning's message is simply this, Fish and Loaves. Fish and Loaves. That's what the message title is this morning. We're going to look at one of the greatest moments, I think. One of the most amazing moments, I think. And our Lord and Savior, our great teacher, Jesus Christ's life and his ministry. And that is the, the, the time in which he fed 5,000 people. Now, there was a time where he fed 5,000. Then a few days or a few weeks after that, he fed another 4,000 out of miracle. And, and we're going to look at this. But the interesting thing and the, the fun thing about this is that this is the only miracle that Jesus performed that is actually accounted for and, and written about in all four Gospels. Aside from the birth and the resurrection, this is the miracle of Jesus Christ that was written in all four Gospels. So one of the things that we're going to do this morning, we're going to read the account out of Luke right now, but then we're going to take a look at some of the different Gospels, the Matthew, Mark, and, and, and John as well. And we're going to see some things about uh, this, this great moment in, in Jesus' ministry. So here we find ourselves in Luke in the ninth chapter. Now let me give you a little bit of background before we start so you can understand. Let me set you up with what's about to happen. Now Jesus has sent his 12 disciples out 
to go and to teach. And he left them, and, and as they left, he said to them, don't take money, don't take food, don't take extra clothes, don't take extra shoes, don't take a walking stick, just take the shirt that you have on your back and go out all to all the different areas and teach the word of God and do miracles and do healing and heal people. And so Jesus gave his disciples to, go, to the authority to go, and, they say, and he told them, when somebody receives you, stay in their home, and if they don't, shake the dust off of your feet and just keep on moving and keep on preaching. So now the disciples have returned. They are coming back, and they're beginning to report to Jesus what they had taught on, what they had seen, what they had experienced. They had begun to learn. Jesus was giving them an application lesson in trusting God. He said, don't take anything. Don't take money. Don't take food. Let God be your provider. Last week, Pastor Deborah talked to, uh, uh, gave us a great message. As a matter of fact, I believe Pastor Jim also said this on Wednesday, one of the most important, if not the most important message that we at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center have heard about God, our provider, something that if you did not grab a hold of last week's message, you need to either go get the CD or go online and listen or watch it because it will change your life. It will bring to you an understanding of God and what God wants to do in your life that you need to have a, whole, you need to have a grasp on. So anyways, Jesus gives his disciples the application and he says, go and trust in God and God will provide. So now they're returning. The second part before we read the story is that the disciples and Jesus had been delivered some bad news in the sense that their friend, Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, the, the messenger that was sent before Jesus to proclaim the name, to, to bring forth the prophecy, John the Baptist had lost his head. He had been beheaded for his belief, for his teachings, for his writings, for his preachings. And so now Jesus, his cousin, Jesus, his close friend, the one that went before Jesus has now lost his life, which signifies the beginning of the end of Jesus in the sense that Jesus knows that John had to go before he did, and now Jesus is on his way to the cross. So... Here we find Jesus now with his disciples and they're all coming back to, to home base or to home camp where Jesus is at. And now we find ourselves in verse number 10 of the ninth chapter of Luke and we read this wonderful and amazing miracle. Verse number 10, it says, And the apostles, when they had returned, told him, speaking of Jesus, all that they had done. And he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him, and he received them and spoke to them the kingdom of God, about the kingdom of God, and healed those who had need of healing. When the day began to wear away, so understand that they came and they spent a day here. There's a lesson to be learned right there that oftentimes it's hard for us to sit in an hour and a half service and call that good. But here they spent the day there. The day began to wear away. See, the day doesn't wear away in an hour. It doesn't wear away in two hours. The day wears away as it progresses over multiple hours. And the day began to wear away. And the twelve came and said to him, Send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions. For we are in a deserted place. They were in an uninhabited place. They were in a place that there wasn't civilization. There wasn't towns. There wasn't thriving business. This was a place that nobody was around. And they were there. The disciples and Jesus were there to go on uh, 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 to get away from everything. But Jesus said to his disciples, You give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all of these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Then he said to the disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. And so they did, and he made them sit down. And he took the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, he blessed. The Greek word there is, he consecrated and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. And so they all ate... And were filled, and twelve baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. So here Jesus is presented with a hardship in the sense that there is a lack of supply. There is nothing. He presents a challenge to his disciples. And he tells them, you feed them. You do something about their hunger. You do something about their need. And yet they come back and they say, there's nothing here. It's insignificant what we have. It's worthless to even mention what we have. But yet somehow the, the multitude is fed. Now, I like numbers. There's so many things uh, that we could learn out of this. But I like numbers. I like to, to, to do things. I like to, I, I, I don't know, I, I guess I just like to blow my mind. 
mind every once in a while by just trying to calculate crazy and odd numbers. And so just bear with me. Now, I understand that the bread that they had in their day and the bread that we had in our day or eat in our day is two completely different types of bread. You and I, when we think of bread, we think of a plastic bag with that little plastic cinch tie that you always lose after you open it. And, you know, you put two pieces of turkey or three pieces of turkey and some lettuce and tomato and call it a sandwich and you're good. Now, their bread was more like a tortilla. It was a lot smaller. But I thought for the sake of, just for, for the sake of understanding, I looked in and I found a piece of bread at my house. They had 20 slices of bread. So they had five loaves of bread. So I thought, okay, 20 slices, that's, that's uh, five loaves for, for uh, 5,000 people. So it's 1,000 people a loaf. All right, well, 20 slices a loaf, that's 50 slices a loaf. That, okay, so now all of a sudden I realized that the 20 slices at 50 pieces a slice feeds 1,000 people. So then I took a piece of bread out, and I said, oh, I don't want to cut 50 slices out of this or 50 pieces out of this one. So I cut it in half, and I thought, well, now all I have to do is cut 25. Well, okay, I'm, I'm weird, so, you know, four lines and four lines means rows of five and columns of five, 25 pieces. So I cut a half of a piece of bread into 25 pieces, which would have been enough to give 5,000 people a slice of bread or a little tiny piece of bread. And you know that that piece of bread separated into 50 pieces or 25 pieces for that half meant that each piece of our modern day bread, our bigger bread, more than they had in their day, our little tiny piece of bread was no larger than the size of a dime. No larger than the size of a dime. So here they show up to Jesus and they say, we've got five loaves and two fish. Now, I wasn't even about to start trying to cut up a fish, get all stinky and nasty like that. So I said, I'll just leave it at the bread. You know, one of the things that the Bible doesn't specify is how this happened. Whether it was when Jesus took the bread and he broke it. When he broke it, was it two bigger pieces of bread? When the disciples had it, did it, did it get bigger there? When they gave it to the groups of 50 on the grass, did, it like, did somebody, when they broke off the piece of bread that they wanted and passed it down, did it get bigger there? What happened? The Bible doesn't say how the bread grew, but the Bible specifies and allows us to see that somehow in the process, five loaves turned into enough to feed everybody that was there, plus to gather up 12 baskets of fragments or 12 baskets of leftovers. So somewhere in the process, the bread and the fish grew. Now, no matter how you describe it, no matter how you explain it, no matter how you try to reason it, no matter how you try to think about it, even if Jesus gave everybody a dime-sized piece of bread, somehow they ate and they were filled off of that dime-sized piece of bread and there was still enough of that dime-sized piece of bread, that little crumb of bread, to throw it back in a basket and gather up 12 baskets full of fragments. So no matter what you do, it's inescapable that this was a miracle. This was a miracle. And there are... There are so many messages and there are so many points and there are so many objects that we could take out of this one great miracle out of the four Gospels that we could apply to our life that we could spend weeks just discussing this. I mean, literally, there's just such a wealth of information. But for the sake of time, because I know that I don't have five fish or five loaves and two fish to try to feed you all today, that we've got to get out of here in a timely fashion. So today I've kind of narrowed some things down. And we're going to talk this morning about the message in the miracle. What is the message in the miracle for you and I? What is the message in these loaves and these fish and what Jesus and his disciples and the people experienced in this miracle? Now again, there are so many things that we can apply. Now let me say this. If you're just joining this or if you've been with us for some time, you know, you've been with us, you know that we are in a capital stewardship campaign, a financial management campaign. We are gathering together as a congregation, as the people of God to come together and do our equal part. It's not about equal equal gifts but equal sacrifice to come together and do our part to, to pay off the mortgage of this building so that we can number one secure the freedom of this place for future generations and not have to worry about what the future holds because this place owes no one nothing. Secondly to not be uh, to not be managed or to be told how to do or what to do anything by a financial institution that holds the note on this building. And thirdly because we want to take what we're giving to a bank and put that into ministry. So we've gathered together and we've done this. And so what we've been doing is we've been speaking about the, the subject of finances. Now when I say that, I want to send something. I want to kind of send a shot across the bow. Or I want, to, I want to encourage you to do something right now. And that is to not shut off because I just said the word finances for the seventh week in a row. 
Because you have the opportunity to do one of two things. You have the opportunity to say in your heart, wow, here they go again talking about money, talking about finances, trying to get something out of me. Or you have the opportunity to say, you know what, I'm going to listen up and I'm going to hear what God has to say in my life. Because can I tell you something? The message today is not about finances. The messages over the past seven weeks on the weekends have not been about finances, but rather they have been about the condition of your and my heart. Because if we can get our heart in alignment to the things of God, then everything else in our life falls into place. And so as we talk about the fish and the loaves, yes, it is about finances. But no, is it not only about finances? This applies to every aspect of your life. Your relationships, your well-being, your health, your jobs, your, whatever it is that you have in your life. This applies to your walk with God and your trust in God and your experiences in the things of God. And I want to encourage you to take as much out of this today, the message in the miracle, as you can. Because I promise you, if you do, you will never be the same because I promise you the 5,000 people that were in that area when Jesus fed them were never the same after they saw what they saw and they experienced what they experienced. So we're going to look at that today. So today, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me now to the book of Mark and let's look at the, uh, let's look at, uh, the account of Mark. And the, number, the first thought for this morning as you're turning to Mark, let me give you the first point in the message of the miracle is that this, there is no better time than the present to do something. There is no better time than the present to do something. You see, the past is over. All you have left of the past is the memories of what you did or the consequences of what you did. You've already acted. You can't go back. There's no time machines. You know, uh, what's his name? The, the doc's not going to come with his DeLorean and the flux capacitor and give you the opportunity to go back and relit. No, you're not going to get that. The past is gone. The future is untold and is unpromised. We don't know what tomorrow holds or whether or not we will even have tomorrow to live. The only thing you and I have in our day and age right now in our possession is the present. I've heard it said that one of the most valuable, if not the most valuable commodity on the face of the earth is not gold, is not the U.S. dollar, is not the value of the stock market, is not real estate, is not precious stones or rubies or diamonds or anything like that. The most valuable commodity is time. Why? Because time is the only thing that once you spend it, you can never get it back and you will never know if you're going to get any more of it. It is not a replenishable resource. And so there is nothing better, there is no better time than the present right now to do something. Now, I had you turn to the book of Mark in the 6th chapter. Let's look at what it says in Mark in the 6th chapter, starting in the 31st verse. The disciples have gathered to Jesus, and they're telling him about what they've done in verse number 31. Jesus says to them, come aside by yourselves. By yourselves. Not with anybody else. Not with the multitudes, not with your disciples or the people that are following you. Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place where nobody's at, where nobody's going to follow you, where nobody's going to bother you, and rest a while. For they were coming and going, and they did not have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. But the, bolt, the multitude saw them departing, and many knew him, and they ran there on foot from all of the cities. And they arrived there before them and came together to him, speaking of Jesus. And Jesus, when he came out, he saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them. Why? Because they were like a sheep not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. You see, the lesson here is that Jesus said, listen, I understand. I sent you out. You had to rely on God. You're tired. Your feet hurt. You've been walking. You've been preaching. You've you got stinky clothes on. You want to change. You want to take a bath. You want to eat something you haven't eaten in a while. Let's go and let's take a vacay. A vacation. Let's get away from all of this. Let's go to a deserted place where there's nobody at. And let's just take some time to recuperate. You and I know the value of a vacation. We know the value of some time off. Why? Well, first of all, because in the creation, God even himself rested on the seventh day. 
We know that seven days a week of working makes one week, not W-E-E-K, but makes one W-E-A-K. It makes one week. You have got to take some time to allow your body to rest, to allow your mind to calm down, to recuperate. That's why we have labor laws. That's why we have all these different laws and regulations. That's why people go on vacations to get away. I'm not demeaning that. I'm not taking that that lowly. But here the deal is, as Jesus said, it's valuable to you and I to go and let's have a vacation. Let's go and have some me time. And here they are preparing themselves for some me time. They got their sandals and their shorts on. They're ready to go hang out by the beach on the water there and just, just chill and, you know, kick out a beach chair, put their feet in the water and just enjoy the desert sun. And yet the multitudes arrived before they even got there. And it says that Jesus was moved with compassion because they were like sheep. They were wandering in the wilderness. They had no protection. They had no guidance. They had no shepherd. And he began to teach them. You see, sacrifice, as we learned last week with Abraham and Isaac, sacrifice is taking that which is valuable to you and I, that which is valuable to us and giving it to God, allowing God to do with it what he will do with it, allowing God to work with it how he will work with it. God asked Abraham to give his son in sacrifice for God as a, as a proof of his love. Now, Abraham could have given anything and that would have cost him. But Abraham had to give his most valuable possession. What is it, I ask you? What is it that is valuable to you? Is it your money? Is it your time? Is it your effort? Is it your energy? Is it your relationships? Is it your family? Whatever it is, God is saying, listen, do you love me or do you trust me enough to allow me to be the one that is in control of that which you seek after most or that which you value most? Because that is where the heart of sacrifice comes with your kids. Do you trust God enough to have faith for God to provide and see over your children with your finances? Do you trust God enough to allow God to be the one that is in control of your finances with your job your promotion your livelihood do you trust and seek after God enough to say God here is that which I am seeking for and I'm going to place it in your hands and I'm going to consecrate it and give it to you and allow you to do with it what you will do that's the question and that's why there is no better time than today right now the present to do something for God you're in the book of Mark. Turn with me a couple pages over to the Mark in the 8th chapter. Mark in the 8th chapter, Jesus Christ is speaking in verse number 35. He says, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's sake will save it. Let me read to you the message paraphrase of what Jesus is saying here. Jesus says in the message paraphrase, self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way to saving yourself, your true self. What good would it do to get everything you want and lose you, the real you? What good would it do to get everything you want and lose you, the real you? What good would it do to spend your entire life making money? What good would it do to spend your entire life seeking after finances, seeking after image, seeking after recollection, seeking after knowledge, seeking after whatever it is that you want and lose the real you, the reason you are here? You see, God didn't just put you on this earth to be successful in business. God didn't just put you on this this earth to be a parent or God didn't just put you on this earth to exist heaven forbid we go throughout our life and we just live a life of existence but rather God put you in here on this place for a reason for a purpose to build and to grow and expand the kingdom of God to do everything we can to, to be representatives of Jesus Christ and what good would it do for you and I to live what our body wants and to lose the reason why we are here by missing out on time, time wasted, spending time on what we're doing else, elsewhere. So we don't want to spend our time and waste our time spinning our wheels, going after our hobbies, going after the things that we, what we, what we desire. I heard it said that what you look at the most is what you love the most. What is it that you're looking at? The word of God, are your eyes fixed on Jesus? Or are they fixed on business? on family, on children, 
on, on interests. Whatever it is, God is saying, are you willing to take the time it's going to require to consecrate this and give it to me and allow me to do with what you want? Or are you going to try to do it on your, on your own? That's the question we're asking here. What good would it do to get everything you want and lose you, the real you? What could you ever trade your soul, with, soul for? Jesus and his disciples, they were hungry. They were tired. They were weary. They had just heard some bad news. They wanted to get some time and just wanted to collect them, themselves. But they saw the opportunity. Jesus was moved with compassion. And he did what he knew how to do best. And that was to give himself for the betterment of other people so that the Spirit of God would be there, that the Word of God would go forth and that the people would be changed forever. We're talking about the message and the miracle. The first thought for this morning was there's no better time than the present to do something. The second thought for this morning is this, that when it is impossible, it is prime time for a miracle. When it is impossible, it is prime time for a miracle. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of John. Let's look at the account in John. John in the sixth chapter. John in the sixth chapter. I love this. When it is impossible, it is prime time for a miracle. John in the sixth chapter, verse number five. John in the sixth chapter, verse number five says, And Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming towards him, he said to Philip, one of his disciples, he asks Philip this, a loaded question meaning a question he already knows the answer to and he knows that Philip doesn't know the answer to. And he asks Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Remember, they were in a deserted place. There's not the bread shop right there. There's not the La Brea bakery right there. He says to Philip, where are we going to buy bread that everybody should eat? Look at verse number six goes on to say, he said this to test him. He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. He allowed the situation to get to the point where it was impossible to see how the disciples who had just gotten back from trusting God to be their provider would respond to the situation. They had just left with no money, with no food, with no clothes, with nowhere to go. And they let God lead them and provide for them. And they all returned with good reports. And now off of the high note of their return, now he says, I'm going to test whether or not you believe that God can provide. Because do you know that God with the Hebrews provided food for them, manna for them in the wilderness, in the deserted desert. Well, don't you know that they are in a deserted place? So if anything, do they not understand that God, if he wanted to, or if he so desired, could make manna appear to feed? So he asks Philip this loaded question, seeing where Philip was. And now Philip gives his reply. Look what verse number 7 goes on to say. Philip answered to him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient that everyone may have a little. Let me explain to you what this statement is. A denarii is a day's wage. So if you work for a day, this is what you earn. So if, again, because I, I, I'm weird like that, I just like to know numbers. I have random facts in my head all the time that are pointless and useless. But did you know that if you work 52 weeks a year, and you work five days a week, you work 260 days. So that is almost a year's wage of bread. Let's just say if the average wage is $30,000 a year, this is about $26,000 of bread is not enough to feed everybody, even if they would have a little. You know when somebody asks you a question... You ever felt the blood rush to your face? You know you're turning red because you know you don't know the answer. You ever felt your palms get a little bit balmy and a little bit sweaty and just kind of thinking, oh no, what are we going to do? Jesus just challenged his disciples by telling them, you feed them. You could tell that they all kind of got a little bit of fluster. They all got a little fill up panics and says, Jesus, even most of a year's wage won't feed them. Whatever could we do? Have you ever noticed, maybe it's just me, maybe I'm alone in this place today, but have you ever noticed that when life is at its hardest, when situations are at their most impossible, that when things are at their, at their lowest moment, when things are, are at the toughest of life, for some reason, I can't explain why, I find myself closest to God in my relationship, yearning and seeking after God. 
Why is it that it's not the times of 12 baskets of abundance when we have overflow, when the boat is nearly sinking because of all the fish that are coming in, because Jesus has told us to do this, and now we have so much that we don't know what to do with? Why is it not those times, but rather the times when we got nothing that we find ourselves most relying upon God. Could it be like Jesus when he asked Philip the question to test him? Could it be that God says, I will allow you to get into these positions so that you can put your faith in me and that you can learn to see that I am your provider, that I will take care of you, that when it's impossible, now there's nowhere else to go but miracle. We're talking about the impossible being the prime time for the miracle. You got your Bibles. We're already in the book of John. Put a little ribbon there because we're going to come back to the next point. But turn with me to the John the 11th chapter. Let's look at an impossible situation. John in the 11th chapter. Jesus is teaching. Jesus is preaching. He hears a messenger that comes to him. A messenger comes to him after being sent from, from, from a family that Jesus loves. Uh, two sisters, Mary and Martha, and their brother Lazarus. Now you might remember Mary and Martha. Mar Mary was the one that was seat seated at Jesus' feet while her sister Martha was in the kitchen preparing. And she got a little overstressed. She got a little uptight because her sister Mary was slacking on helping. And Mary just wanted to hear the word of God. Jesus was really close to, these, to this family. So now the two sisters send a messenger to Jesus saying, Jesus, come quickly, Lazarus is sick. Now, Jesus, most scholars, many scholars believe that Jesus was about a day's journey away from where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived. So the messenger arrives to Jesus and says, come quickly, Jesus, uh, Lazarus is sick. Now, look what it says in the fourth verse of the 11th chapter. The fourth verse, Jesus says, when he heard, he says, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Saying, hey, psh, psh, don't worry. This isn't to death, but it's rather that the glory of God would be shown. You're going to see the glory of God out of Lazarus' situation. Okay, all right. So the messenger says, all right, okay, I'll, I'll let them know that. Well, little do they know, if it, Jesus was a day's journey away, little did they know that shortly, must have been shortly after that messenger left, that Lazarus had died. Because... A few days later, as Jesus remains, after hearing this word, two days later, Jesus is still in the place where he was at teaching. Jesus said, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to take my time. I'm going to take my time. I'm not going to rush. Now, after two days of teaching, Jesus says, all right, it's time for us to go and wake up Lazarus. The disciples said, well, if Lazarus is asleep, leave him asleep, Jesus. Rest is good for the body. He'll recover. And Jesus says plainly to the disciples, Lazarus is dead. He died. Uh-oh. So Jesus waited two days. It took the messenger a day. Now it's been three days. And Jesus says, Lazarus is dead. He goes on to tell the disciples a shocking statement about the impossible. Jesus says to them, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. What? What? Jesus, the one who's moved with compassion. You just said that Lazarus is dead and you're glad? You're glad that you were there? You're glad that you missed out on Lazarus dying? Why? What, what, what would prompt him to say something like that? I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, because he's dead, let's go to him. What good could we do? Could we go and visit his graveside? Could we go pay our respects and say some kind words about Lazarus and, and, con and, and console his sisters who are upset? So Jesus and his disciples make their way. A day's journey again. Now it's the fourth day. Now Jewish tradition believed and, and custom was that when somebody died, you buried them the day they died. There wasn't the embalming practices that we have. They didn't have freezers and things like we have in our day. When somebody died, you stuck them in the ground, man, because otherwise it wasn't very long before they started to smell. And so they also believed that the, the soul would hover over the body for three days. And so here Jesus now arrives on the fourth day. Lazarus has been buried. Lazarus' soul, according to their beliefs, according to what they knew, Lazarus' soul had gone. His body and his soul were now separate. It was now officially impossible. Could not be done for Lazarus to come back to life. 
And so as Jesus arrives in town, Martha comes to Jesus and Jesus begins to speak to her and console her. And Jesus groans within, him, within himself. His sister, her sister Mary, the one that sat at the feet of Jesus, the one that heard the word of Jesus, was a little upset. So when Jesus came to town, she did not make the effort to go see him. But rather, she stayed at home because what else is there to do? And Martha goes and calls for Mary and says, the master is calling for you. So Mary comes out. And he says to them, says to the sisters, take me to your brother's grave. Do you believe that he can be raised, resurrected? And they say, well, you know, Jesus, we've heard the teachings. We know that we'll see him again, that this isn't goodbye, that this is we'll see you later. All the things that you and I know about. And Jesus says, that's not what I'm asking. Do you believe? And Mary says to Jesus, Jesus, Lazarus has been dead for four years. Days, kind of twisting the knife a little bit in the back there, making it go in a little bit deeper, rubbing a little bit of salt. He has been dead for four days and he is starting to smell. There is nothing you can do. And Jesus says, take me. There he weeps, not because he's sad that Lazarus died, but he has compassion again, that compassion that he had for the people as he saw the multitude, and Jesus weeps and he groans within himself. And now in verse number 41, Jesus begins to pray. But listen to his prayer. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the people... Who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe you sent me. You see, Jesus was praying to God not because Jesus needed to pray, but Jesus was praying. He said, Lord, I thank you that you hear me. Did you hear that? God hears me. Lord, I thank you that they would believe. Did you hear that? That God's going to do something that you believe that he sent me. And then Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. And after four days of being dead, after they had believed that his soul had departed, after his body had begun to decay, here this dead man rises from the grave and walks out of the tomb. And the Bible goes on to tell us that they had dinner together. When it is impossible, it is prime time for a miracle. Don't shortchange God by thinking that he can't do anything. Do we serve the God bound by laws of nature? Or do we serve the God of the improbable? The God of the impossible? The message in the miracle is that when there is impossibility, that is prime time for a miracle. The last one for this, this morning. The last thought for this morning in the message of the miracle, number three. In the deficit came abundance. You and I know that word deficit real well. We know about budget deficits. We know about financial deficits. We know about in San Bernardino job deficits, meaning that there is more going out than there is coming in. You're losing money, going broke. And in the deficit came abundance. Did you know that in the natural, there will never, listen, there will never, in the natural, there will never be enough? You know why? Because we're consumers. We are a consumer uh, uh, world, right? You know what consumers do? We consume. It means we buy something, we eat something, whatever it is, we, we unwrap it from its prepackaged, we use it until it breaks, until it wears out, we throw it away, and then we get a new, bigger, better one. <laughs> Meaning that there will never be enough in the natural. But in the deficit came abundance. In the deficit came abundance. Now, I had you mark uh, John the 6th chapter. Let's go back and read what he said in John the 6th chapter about this miracle. Remember, Philip has been asked by Jesus a tested question or a loaded question. You can tell that, you can probably just imagine Philip turning red. His palms are a little sweaty. He's kind of like, I don't know what to do. What are we going to do? And Philip is bailed out by another uh, disciple, Andrew. And Andrew brings a little boy. And he says, Lord, verse number 9. There is a lad here, a boy, who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? What are they among so many? Andrew comes and says, God, this is all we could find. Jesus, this is all we could find is five loaves and two fish. But that doesn't even put a dent in the dent that would need to be made for these people. It's not even worth mentioning, but this is all we could have. 
The question is, what miracle is there in your sacrifice? What miracle is there in your sacrifice? Because this little boy was the only one of 5,000 people that they could find that had anything to eat. And so they brought it, and guess what? That little boy had to give up his lunch. But what miracle is there in your sacrifice? What miracle is there? It's the moments in our lives when we look to God and we say, God, I have nothing but five loaves and two fish. What good is this going to do in my situation that God looks and says, bring it to me? Like Jesus said about the fish and loaves. Bring it to me. And Jesus laid his hands on it. Jesus blessed it. Jesus broke it. And Jesus distributed it. When there is deficit, when there is lack, when we bring the sacrifice to God, when we bring what little we have to God, regardless of how much it may be in value to us, God says, I will see the value in the deficit and I will bring abundance. Over these past seven weeks, we've seen this. What's in your house? I've got nothing but a jar of oil. What's in your possession? I've got nothing but a little bit of oil and some flour to make some bread before I die. What do you have? I've only got a couple of mites to drop in the bucket. What do you have? I've only got five fish and two loaves, but what good is that? Through all the examples, through all the things that we've seen, if we've learned anything, is that God says, take what you have. Whether it's big or small, whether it's great or little, whether it's significant or insignificant, and bring it and bring it to God and let God do with it what God will and see that the oil will supply all your needs, that you will not go hungry when you thought you were going to die, that the mites were more valuable than anybody else had, that the fish and the loaves will do more than enough and carry an abundance. God is asking you and I, you do something. The question is, will we look at our situation and say, God, there's nothing that we can do, or will we look at God and say, God, this is all I can do, but I trust that you're going to make it more. That is the question of our lives. And that's why I say it goes beyond your finances. It goes beyond your families. It goes all the way to the walk of life. Because God's going to ask you time and time and time again to do something for the kingdom of God that's going to stretch beyond your faith, that's going to stretch beyond what you think you can do. But then you look to God and you say, God, I see a deficit in my life, but I'm going to give it to you. And I'm going to trust that at the end, I will see an abundance in what there was once a deficit. It's the message of the cross. In 2 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, it says that Christ was crucified in weakness, but in strength and in power, he was raised. So you and I who live in weakness could now live in the power that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead. God shows us this from the beginning to the end, that we live a life of weakness, but God says that is nothing compared to the power that I have. We just got to trust him. We just got to trust him. Let me give you this concluding thought. I'll put it up on the overhead. Matthew, the 14th chapter, verse number 20, guys, verse number 20. Matthew, the 14th chapter, verse number 20, it says this. So they all ate and were filled. Jesus was filled. The disciples who were tired, who were weary, were filled. The people that came and followed after Jesus in the deserted place were filled. The little boy who gave up of his lunch or gave up of his five loaves and two fish, was filled. They all ate, and they were filled. That is why Matthew, the sixth chapter, the 33rd verse says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Why? Because God takes care of those who follow him. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord today? Hey, listen, let me do one more thing. Let me ask you, I thank you guys for remaining seated. Please give me a moment more. Please don't get up, don't walk around. Very important. I promise I'll let you out in just a few moments. But let me do this. Let me ask you this question. Answer it within your heart. If you were to leave this place today and you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? That's the question I want you to answer. Nobody will know that answer except you and God. But let's go over maybe some of those answers that you've had in your heart. 
Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that you can get to heaven because you think so or because you want to or because you hope so? Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, a Hindu, or a Muslim, or any other type of world religion, that by default that you're going to get to heaven? Hey, did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents took you to church as a child, that because you were baptized or christened as a baby, that you're going to get into heaven? You won't find that in the Word of God. Did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you went to Sabbath school or Saturday school or catechism classes, that because you attend church on Christmas and on Easter, because you're here today, that you're going to get into heaven? Did you know nowhere in the Word of God does it say that? Did you know that you can't get to heaven because you volunteer in the youth or the children's or the ushers? You sing in the choir, you carry the pastor's Bible. Did you know you can't get to heaven because you've memorized John 3.16 or a few other verses? You can't get to heaven that way. You won't find that in the Bible. Why? Because it's God's heaven, it's God's way. And the only way you and I can get to heaven is God's way. It's not about how good you and I can be. It's not about how we can do what, what we can do on the outside to make ourselves look good. The Bible tells us that our good deeds according to God's righteousness are like filthy rags. So you can't get to heaven because you're a good person. Because you don't cheat on your taxes. Because you, don't, you do more good in your life than bad. Because you give to charitable organizations. That's not going to get you to heaven. I love you enough. Listen, I honor you enough. I respect you enough to tell you the truth. Even though it may be a hard truth to hear. That you can't get to heaven because you're a good person. You can't get to heaven because you sit in church. You're not going to get to heaven because you've called yourself a Christian. You're not going to get to heaven because you want to get there. The only way you and I can get to heaven is God's way. And Jesus Christ was speaking to a religious leader of his day, Nicodemus. And he says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must be born again. There it is. That's how we do it. God's heaven, God's way. There it is. Well, you think of born again, you think of radical, crazy, weirdo, out of control Christianity. But let me tell you something. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. And this is what it means, that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. God's after an all or nothing relationship with him. Let me prove it to you in the Bible. In the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church and he says, I know your works. When I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Shocking statement from the words of Jesus. And what he is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me define it to you in terms of your relationship with Jesus Christ. It means that you're a little bit in and you're a little bit out. You're a little bit up and you're a little bit down. You're kind of floating around occasional church attendance, doing some of your own thing, doing some of God's thing. You got too much of God in you to enjoy the world. You got too much of the world in you to enjoy the things of God. You're riding the fence right down the middle. And Jesus Christ says that if you are in that position in life, you are deceived in thinking you're going to make it. Heaven forbid you and I go our entire lives thinking we're going to make it and find out we didn't. Can't get to heaven your way. We can't get to heaven my way. Some well-meaning church committee's way. The only way you and I can get there is God's way, and that is through Jesus Christ. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one goes to the Father except through him. So let's not do it any other way but God's way today. And Jesus said this. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. So today, here's what I want to do. I want to give you the opportunity to ensure your place with God in heaven. You know, you might say, Pastor Luke, I don't know that heaven or I don't know that hell is real. But let me tell you something. Just because you're not sure or you're not settled on whether or not it's real or not doesn't mean it's not real. Why? Because you could have grown up in a place all your life where you had never seen or heard of a semi-truck. Yet you go stand in the slow lane of the freeway and lo and behold, you'll meet one. Just because you can't see it, just because you haven't felt it, doesn't mean it's not real. Why? Because heaven is a real place. God loves you enough, respects you enough to talk about it in his Bible. Hell is a real place. Jesus Christ respects us enough and, and thinks it important enough to mention it. Therefore, it's important enough for me to tell you that it's real, regardless of how you feel about it. It's real. So let's not do it any other way, but let's do it God's way. And here's what I'm going to do in just a moment. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to smack my hand on my Bible. Three, just like that, real loud. And when I smack my hand on the Bible in just a moment, all together, we'll do this at the same time. I want to give you the opportunity to give Jesus Christ your heart, give your heart, give your life to him. And what you're doing is I want you to pop your hand up. We'll do it all together at just the same time. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give Jesus all my heart. I want to give him all my life. I want to go to heaven. I want to leave hell behind. I want to make sure today that I get in heaven all my life. 
And I'll see your hand. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. And you say, Pastor, look, I don't know if I can raise my hand. I don't know. Somebody's going to see me. I'm going to make that profession. And I, I'm just going to be embarrassed. You know what? You might be. But get over it. Why? Because wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't move forward for God in a warm and welcome and loving place like the church? You see, the decision's yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way into your life. You have got to choose and allow him to come into your life. You see, God has already done everything he could to ensure that you don't live or end up in hell. Why? By giving his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten and a bloody and a, and a spectacle on the cross for you and me, for our sins. And in return, he wants all of our heart. And in return, he wants all of our lives. Who should raise their hands today? If you've never given him all your heart, if you've never given him all your life, today is the day of your salvation. Pop your hand up, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it in just a moment, and you can put it right back down. Who should raise their hands? If you're not sure today, make sure. Don't leave this place without making sure. Maybe you did this at a Billy Graham or a Harvest Crusader as a child, but you never really followed through with it. Today, get your hand up so I can see it, and let's move forward in your relationship with God. Finally, who should raise their hands if you've been living lukewarm instead of hot or for Jesus Christ. Today, if that's you in this place, if you can do more of your own thing instead of God's thing, get your hand up in just a moment. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down and we'll move forward from there. The decision is yours. Today is the day of your salvation all over this auditorium. If you're watching in the Love Rock Cafe or in the outer foyer by television, or if you're even watching us online right now, if that's you, wherever you're at, Stop what you're doing and get ready. You put your hand up in just a moment. If you're watching online, you can click the little blue button right there on the side of the screen. This is the moment of your salvation. Don't pass this by. Remember, there is no better time than the present to do something, to start it. If that's you in this place, get ready. Hands are getting ready to go up. Here we go. I'm going to count. If that's you, get ready. Here we go. One, two, three. Three, let me see your hands in this place today. I see you. One, two, I see you. Where are you at? Let me see your hands. Three, I see you. Three wise people. Four, I see you right there. Four wise people in the family rooms. Is there anybody in the family rooms? Five, I see you right there. Let me see your hands. If you got your hands up, let me see your hands. Six, seven, I see you back there in the back. Eight, I see you right there. I got you, I think, already. But nine, nine wise people. Anybody else? Ten, I see you, my friend. Ten wise people. Anybody else in this place today? In the family rooms, is that you? In the foyer, if that's you, get your hand up so I can see it. You say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. 9, 10, 11, I see you guys. 11 wise people. Anybody else in this place today? You say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. Today is the day of your salvation. Don't pass this opportunity by. Come on, if that's you in this place today. You know you should. Get your hand up so I can see it. And let's move forward in your relationship today. Anybody else today? 11 wise people. Anybody else today? Well, praise God for the 11. Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. For the 11 of you that raised your hands, whether you're in the family rooms, in the back or the front, wherever you're at, for the 11 of you that raised your hand, you said you want to give them all your heart. You said you want to give them all your life. We want to help you. We want to pray with you. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life. Let us help and pray with you and get some things into your hands. For the nine of you that didn't raise your hands but should have raised your hands, it's not too late. In a moment, we're all going to get, get together. We're going to stand up. If that's you, grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible. A friend if you need a friend. And get out of your seat, get out of your chair, and get into the aisle and come and meet me up here at the altar. And let's change destinies together. I want you to look over to your neighbor as we stand and ask them, do you need to go and bring them if they need to come? Or if they'll come, bring them and let's all stand together. If you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, whether you're in the family room or the back or the front, come on. You come. You come right now. Come on. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. And come. Come on. If that's you in the family room, come on. Get your kids. Get your stuff. Come on. You can come. Well, praise God, you guys came. Listen, guys, those of you that raised your hand, you didn't come. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You say, I want to get saved by raising your hand. 
So I want to encourage you, if that's you, get out of your seat, get out of your chair, and get up here. Stop playing games with God. If you think that that's all it's going to take for you to get into heaven, to have a relationship with God, you are mistaken in what you believe, and you're going to be tested on that. So I want to encourage you, this is the moment of your salvation. Get out of your seat, get out of your chair. As we're doing this, you come. And if, they, if you don't come, then that's on you. But for those of you that came, today is a new day. You know what? You're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. It's the first day of the rest of your life. <laughs> See this guy right over here? This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is like one of the coolest guys. He's going to take you right over there. I promise nothing weird goes on. I promise, okay? He's going to lead you in a prayer. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come in your heart, come in your life. He's going to give you some literature, some free, some free, book, or free book that just says, hey, you got saved. Now what do you do to help you along the way? And we're going to give you a friend, a spiritual personal trainer, somebody that will come alongside of you and teach you some things about the Word of God so you don't go back to the life that you came from. So if you guys would just go to your left, my right, right over here with Pastor Joel. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.